Very good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to yet another EULA webinar. And uh, we thank you for participating in this webinar. Just a quick reminder that this webinar has been approved for 1.5 hours of professionalism CPD credits. Um, and um, it's um, depending on the province, it's approved for 1.5 hours by Ontario, and it's one hour by British Columbia. So depending on where you're joining us today. And today's topic is going to be on everything practice management. So we really want to hash out the key components of practice management um, for you as a legal practitioner. Uh, so practice management entails different professionalism practices, but our focus today is going to highlight what that means uh, from you being a legal professional. And um, as I let um, our clients trickle in, so with every ULaw webinar, we have an agenda, and today's agenda is going to cover, and what we've really done is we've tried to understand the, the key guidelines uh, from a legal professional standpoint in Canada and look at the different obligations that you have as a legal professional, uh, almost as a review or as a checklist, if you will, of things that you probably want to keep in mind and adhere to and ensure that you have a process to follow so that you're covering all these obligations as a legal professional. So we're going to talk about each topic one at a time. So we have about seven different areas of focus, and we'll try to encompass all other aspects of your professional obligations under uh, these seven different topics. Okay, so we're going to look at client intake, service and communication. How would you like to organize yourself and the policies that govern your firm's way of doing client intake, um, servicing your clients, and how do you communicate with them? How do you have a file management process in place so that you can not only manage files, but you can chronologically access um, and retrieve information faster so that you're saving time for both yourself and your clients? Um, financial management, which is a really key component of you, many times being a solo entrepreneur or as a business individual, running a legal firm um, as a business, and how do you ensure financial management not only for your business, but also for um, the trust and general accounting that you'd have to deal as part of your obligation for your client files. Business management, we want to talk about the benefits of running a business, why do this at all, and the, comp you know, the obligations that go around uh, you running a business. Professional management, again, you owe this to your profession. How can you be uh, a better legal professional? Um, one of the great things that you're doing today is actually being part of this webinar, which is uh, CPD accredited, which is uh, one of the obligations of this profession is to have a certain number of professional and substantial hours of um, you know, professional development, if you will, uh, in a year. We're going to talk about time management, which relates to both how do you manage time from um, a legal professional you are, as well as as a business owner, and how do you ensure that you have time for yourself, which then comes down to our final topic about personal management. You know, do you really enjoy what you do? How can you be better at uh, the success areas of practice uh, that you focus on? What are some of the areas of practice that you can be better at? How do you measure and then work towards those things? So let's now look at each and every topic one at a time, and uh, hopefully we have uh, a good session for the next an hour and a half. At any time, if you have any questions, please feel free to use our chat window to ask any questions that you may have. Uh, as this is a CPD-approved um, webinar, we'd like to take those questions at the end of the session. So moving along to my first major subject area would be client intake service and communication under the professional obligations. Okay, so what, what does that really mean? So what are we looking for when it comes to intake service and communication? So the client intake almost becomes your first touch point of communication with your client or your prospective client. So you being a legal professional, um, let's say you've planned out to excel in what you do um, in certain areas of practice maybe, or you're still trying out the different areas of practice, um, you have your own ways of marketing your service. 
but then that first intake form or a mechanism that you use to communicate or have your clients or prospective clients communicate with you is something that you really need to think about. When you accept that intake, you want to ensure there's a detailed recording of those consults or that informational sessions, if you will, that you may have with these prospective clients. Okay? Um, so we have clients now having intake forms automated on their websites. You could have client intake done through phone conversations, and there are many methods that you could actually accomplish those things. Regardless of how you accomplish it, it becomes really important that you at your end record the conversations and the calls that you take with those prospective clients. Ensure that you have a, a good mechanism to check for conflicts. Um, this is one of the key obligations that you have as a legal professional, that if that individual, he or she, you know, determines to retain you, uh, even before you create, let's say, a matter for that individual prospective client, you want to ensure that you're fully aware of any conflicts that there may be in representing him or her uh, or an entity. Let's say you move forward, you've done your due diligence and there are no conflicts in representing that client. You wanna move on to the next level of the maturity in that whole life cycle, which is really determining how do you wanna work with this client? How do you determine your fee structure? And how do you document the whole communication and the service um, delivery methodology that you have as a legal professional. So you want to ensure you have, let's say if you are into trust management, you have a retainer letter that's available for different silos of practice and the retainer clearly indicates the policies and the rules and the fee structure that it governs. You also want to dictate a clear non-engagement structure. So let's say if the individual for some reason after the initial consult does not necessarily engage you or retain you, um, having a clear non-engagement document allows you to have a logical closure to that whole correspondence. And um, again, determining collateral for fees, are you going to take and trust money? Um, what's an appropriate amount based on your experience of dealing with such clients and such areas of practice what are your terms and obligations in terms of payments? So you really want to outline each and every aspect of how you want your clients to um, collaborate in that whole service area. Now, if you are in the business of accepting retainers, which I believe is a great way that um, you can safeguard your interest. Um, you know, we've obviously heard of stories where you've actually done all the work, and if you didn't have a retainer, there's every possibility of the clients um, not paying you. And there are many instances in the legal business of doing that. So the fact that you do have that vehicle of ensuring and safeguarding your work and effort, um, if you are in the business of doing a retainer, you want to ensure that that trust money um, gets deposited into the trust account. And it's always a great habit and an exercise to provide your clients with a trust receipt so there are no conflicts um, at the end of the day. And as I mentioned, if things didn't pan out, providing a non-engagement letter is a really good logical closure to that correspondence. Okay, so really high level, we've looked at recording your consults, consultations, that first step in the door uh, by your prospect, taking them through your life cycle that you have determined that's convenient, uh, but it's still really important as part of your obligation to ensure you conflict check once you're happy with representing that individual, determining the collateral and ensuring that if you deal with trust money, um, depositing that into your trust account okay, and providing a receipt. Moving along, a quick snapshot of all the potential documents that become a part of that exercise of intaking the client, servicing and communicating upfront about who you are and what your legal firm can do and how you plan on doing business with that individual. So determining the nature and scope of the matter, making sure that that is an area of practice that you excel and you're comfortable dealing with and bringing in and ensuring that you document, and this is a very important step, 
is being able to document on paper, if possible, the responsibilities of the client. So it could be right from the retainer that they agree to pay you, the fee structure, as well as terms of payments. So ensuring that they pay you within you know, net 15, 30 days, uh, determining what an interest charge may be if you plan on doing so, and letting them know what those responsibilities are. Um, scheduling and um, you know, courses representation. Um, so if court visits, I'm sure are a big part of your overall matter and docket. So ensuring that you have a way of reminding yourself, making that part of that communication. Method and frequency of communication. So it's great if you can establish upfront with your clients that maybe you're gonna send them emails, electronic ways of communicating, or maybe you're gonna send them mails. And if it's invoices, again, could be over electronic invoice or otherwise, also determining the frequency of communication. So it's going to be on a weekly basis. Again, really depends on the matter, really depends on that nature and scope of that matter. But to that particular scope of matter, whatever is the pertinent frequency, you want to establish that and make sure your clients are aware so they're not caught off guard. Retainer agreements, it's um, having, uh, you know, templatized documents just so that you can prioritize time and have that done as one of the fundamental steps forward. Termination details. So for some reason, again, let's say you re the client retains you, but for some reason um, it didn't go well, you also want a way to terminate that overall matter and the retainer. Um, we also have legal practitioner client confidentiality, so ensuring that you let your clients know that the content and the communication uh, is confidential, and also establishing the rules around electronic communication, letting them know the risks that are involved in certain methods of communication. So email, again, this is one of the things that you want to be cognizant of. It's you know best practices, also understanding and letting your client know um, what the risks are with each of those types of methods, okay? So again, this is just a quick snapshot of the potential types of documents and um, that you would actually use during that initial life cycle. Now let's move on to the next aspect of that professional obligation. So we're talking about file management, okay? And again, as you can see, I'm not really looking to read out what you can already see on the screen, but file management is really about your back office operational aspects to managing a client's file, okay? Whether it's having a way to organize files for ease of retrieval, organizing files for ease of, um, you know, docket, organizing your files for ease of getting paid, whatever that may be, it's always a great habit to understand and define a process across your firm. So if it's just yourself, then it's much easier that you're able to comply. It just becomes a little bit more cumbersome when you're actually in a legal firm or if your law firm actually has additional re you know, resources, right, from admins to coworkers or others who all need to comply with how you manage your files and how you document it and how you retrieve when needed, right? So having that documented, having that available so that almost like a handbook, if you will, so that everyone complies with that same legal workflow steps would make it much more simpler and less cumbersome for you at the end of the day, okay? So having a checklist of all the incoming matters, so understanding really um, what are all these files, Conflict check completion. So really, if you've done conflict checks for individual clients, um, you know, there is a law society report that you can file which illustrates or outlines why you or your legal firm determined that client was not a conflict, okay? And the law society also talks uh, briefly about, how, you know, in terms of helping clients, but how you separate files, even if it's for the same client, and if you're managing two separate matters, so you may be doing a small claims, you may actually be doing a family matter, and even if it's for the same client, ensuring there are separate files um, under each matter for those clients just makes it easier for you to organize 
and manage those files. It's easy for you to dock it. It's easier for you to raise an invoice. It's easier for you to manage your trust funds. Um, but having an overview of that client's information will always be handy. But separating out as files makes it simpler. A good example, a small claim matter or a POA might actually get done in you know, a certain time period, but a criminal matter for that same client may actually extend for a much longer period. So at any time for an individual client, you may actually have an active file open and actually may have another file closed. Okay, so having those differentiations also really helps for you to search and focus on the files that need your most attention. So chronological and secure way of organizing electronic files. Personal recording of client interactions. Okay, so with the advent of technology, um, you have email becoming a big component of how you communicate with and interact with your clients. You will still be able to send out mails, but I think gone are the days where you're writing mails to client to communicate. Um, so email is a preferred uh, electronic and a very convenient way of communicating. But it's also important that if you plan on docketing each and every interactive communication with your client, that make that as part of your file, make that as part of your dockets, and uh, ensure there's a process again to record those interactions. And last but not the least, at any time, let's say during a spot audit or your regular review, if you have a need to access a certain file, then you probably need from the get-go, by design, a proper organization of these files through numeric and cross-indexing. And what does cross-indexing mean? So the ability for you to maybe have additional parties involved where you're able to cross-index individuals as they pertain to, let's say, a client in a particular matter that may actually be another party in a different matter. So if you're doing conflict checks, having that cross-indexing is really going to help you ensure that you've done the right conflict screening and you're prepared to have all the information you need to represent that individual, okay? So ensuring that you have a process by design for managing your files after you've had your initial client intake almost becoming the back end of your business is a very important next step as part of your legal obligation. Okay, to a very interesting segue from file management to financial management. Okay, so it's always, uh, always exciting to talk about financial management to legal professionals. Um, it's, and part of that, and part of their obligation, or really part of that discipline that these different sections talk about, um, really helps you remind yourself. You know, it's many times these are things that you already know in a very subliminal way. These are things that are behind your back, and you've got it, but being part of webinars such as these, reiterating and you know, refocusing on those points becomes very critical so that you can go back that Monday morning and see if you're actually doing this. And if you're doing this, can you be better at it? And if you're already really good and you've really maximized yourself, then obviously then you're gonna sleep very well and you know that you have a process to take care of you. So from a financial management perspective, even before going to managing your finances, let's start with how you determine a proper fee schedule once you've accepted that client. Okay, so this really is about starting with how do you determine the fees for a particular matter? Are you able to, through your experience or through talking with other colleagues or speaking with them, uh, do you have a good sense of the type of money you should be asking for for that kind of service? Okay, so it really depends on the area of practice. Is it going to be billable? Is it going to be a flat rate? Is it going to be a mix and match of these? Um, it may be a contingency, it may be a block fee. So there's varieties of ways in which you can, uh, as a legal professional, charge for fees today. And um, I think individuals, you know, common man who's coming to you to have you represent him or her needs to be aware of this, those different types of combinations, okay? So proper fee scheduling of those different fees is really important, not only for your own sanity, but also to communicate to your clients. Now that you've determined what those fee structures are, 
how do you record that? How do you ensure that as you continue to do the work for those individual files, how do you record the time? Uh, is it done through timesheets or is it tracked right within a matter? Those are the things that you determine, build the process along, and ensure that it's all documented. Always having an accounting system, a legal accounting system such as U-Law or PC Law is going to go a long way because these systems have by design the ability to capture time and capture the effort put in uh, right within the product by the design. So having an accounting system, again, you can have any system possible. You can have a paper-based system. Regardless of what system you use, um, it's important that you have these core concepts in mind. A prop transmission and delivery of invoices. So this is something, you know, we've been in business for many years now, and this is one of the important things that we find that our clients tend to fail. One of the important steps is after they've done all the work, um, one of the most important steps to do, whether you're getting paid directly for your general payment or whether that's money that you need to move from trust to general, it is important that you submit an official document that outlines all the effort you've put in for that file. So in this case, it's an invoice that you send to your client that outlines the effort. And um, what does that invoice entail? Again, you can take cue from colleagues, you can take cue from really the industry itself. Um, overall, it's talking about the time that you've spent on the particulars of what that was, so really a, a high-level understanding of what that docket was, maybe a little bit of explanation about what went behind that docket. So if it was an initial consult, you could say it was an initial consult, you know, we were at, actually at this particular place, we met, discussed, whatever those particulars may be, so that your client is always happy to see the extent of explanation you can provide. Then comes the actual money or the actual um, the dollars that are behind that docket. So for that particular docket, do you plan on billing him per hour, by the minute? You know, is it a flat fee or is it even a pro bono? So highlighting what those are is really important as part of that invoice. Systematic tracking of both uh, overpayments as well as uh, you know underpayments sometimes, right, of accounts. Um, we have clients that have often complained about how clients, their end clients, don't necessarily pay out that last 10 or $12 that's outstanding. So overpayments in many ways is great, but you also want to be cognizant of those clients uh, that you want to track, um, that default, okay? So that's really taking care of your finances as a business. Then comes, I mean, now that we've spoken about a little bit of trust, um, trust money um, and retainers, we want to then talk about general accounts. Another very key aspect to you being a legal professional is where you spend money in advance on behalf of your clients. And if you are actually using your business credit card or your personal money to disperse your clients, then it's really key to keep a good track of all that money spent by file, by client, so that it's easy for you to document it as part of your invoice and ensure that you're getting paid for it because that's money that you've already spent and if you're not tracking it and if you don't have a way of getting that money back, then that's just money lost, right? So you want to make sure that you have those receipts and entries of those disbursements um, so that you can have that paid. Now, if these are disbursements that cannot be, uh, that you know, you're not charging really to your client and uh, these are expenses that you're still charging into your business, you still want to hold on to your receipts so that it's easier for you to reconcile at the end of the month. Maintaining the original bank statement, again, this is actually part of the bookkeeping guidelines, um, and many times it's asked as part of the spot audit. Maintaining original bank statements and books, cancel checks, and duplicate deposit slips. Because these are documents that actually happen in real life, and unless you have a way of recording it, and I would go one step further in saying if you can build a discipline of having an electronic version of all these physical copies, then you're building a discipline for success and you're building a discipline for lesser um, heartache when time comes to reconciling or even tax time. 
Okay, so having that discipline to really record it when it happens and have a way of storing or digitizing your physical copies, whether it's documents or receipts, is really going to go a long way. Um, and that's almost everyone's fear factor. It's a bit of that lethargy of not being able to do that is really what it comes down to, to be honest. Preparation of financial statements. Okay, so this goes back to a big part of financial management is really asking yourself, um, you know, where am I making my money? All right, how much of money have I made on a weekly, monthly, yearly basis? So whatever is your time period that you want to have a review. These statements are not only going to help you as part of your audit, because these are documents that you need to provide, like the fee book, but these are also going to be documents uh, like the revenue report or a profit and loss, really to understand where you stand as a business and where is your success, really analyzing your business from a financial standpoint, okay? Really to gauge your firm's health. Um, so having, again, a process that you can follow um, to understand this. So the first step is to really track it. If you can track it, um, or if you store that information, you can always measure it. And after you've measured it, you take the next step of analyzing that data and understanding proactive next steps that you can take to learn from what you measured, okay? So that's really the three big things um, if you look at any business, being able to track it, have a mechanism of way of capturing the data, analyzing and measuring the data, once you've analyzed it, understanding the next steps or improved efficiencies, especially from a financial management perspective. So when we spoke about the different documents that go behind, here's a quick snapshot of some of the financial management documents, and you probably are already aware of many of these documents. So this is just a bit of a, a reiteration, if you will. Ledgers, so you've got your client's trust ledger, and your general ledger. Again, if you're not into trust in terms of dealing with trust money, then you only have to deal with the general ledgers, okay? And then you have your, if you deal with trust, obviously, then you have your trust receipts journal as an example, disbursement journal that applies to the general as well. And the monthly reconciliation, which is all, again, a big fear factor, but there are tools and products out there that make that much simpler. And with the advent of technology and the investment in legal technology, um, it's only getting, getting better um, in terms of how easy it is now for legal professionals using tools um, to reconcile their monthly statements for both trust in general. Trust being a very important um, law society compliant document. You being able to reconcile your trust and have that available every month is a big part of um, a legal professional that you are. Okay. There are many more financial management reports and documents that you can talk about. As I mentioned, your fee book, uh, your expense book, you could talk about your profit and loss based on you know your fees and expenses and how they marry. So there are many more documents that go behind the scene. This is just a quick snapshot of some of the work, uh, especially when it relates to trust. So let me do a quick recap before I move on to the business management aspect of today's webinar. Okay, so we talk, spoke about the top three areas. We spoke about client intake, service and communication, right, and the different components behind the scene. How do you intake? How do you service? How do you establish your means of communicating frequency uh, right from the get-go? How do you manage your file? having a process to manage those files so that it's easy to search for it, not only for yourself, but for others within your firm, really having that as a policy or as a process. And then we spoke about financial aspects of it, how you manage your finances, how do you establish fee structures, and the different documents that go behind establishing the financial statements that you present to the law society, as well as you having in control as the business owner. Now we're gonna move along to the next aspect of our professional obligation, which is the business management, okay?
Okay. So we spoke about how you are not only a legal professional by, you know, by who you are in terms of what you do, but if you are actually a solo entrepreneur, or let's say you don't necessarily work in a law firm, if you're working in a law firm, then these are some things that your law firms are already doing. Because by design, they are able to hire the individuals to accomplish what a business management goal should be. But if you are a solo entrepreneur or if it's a smaller legal firm or a law firm, then these are some things that you actually have to handle as well. Okay, so this really highlights key components that you want to keep in mind and work towards as you manage your business. Software, you know, it's a really open-ended statement. But what does it really mean in terms of today's webinar and today's context of what I'm trying to establish is actually having a reputed legal accounting software and practice management software. Whether, again, the software is something that helps you be efficient. Um, if you are efficient and just using um, a paper-based method because of the volume of the work you do, and if that helps you justify why you should not have software, then by all means, as long as you can generate the documents that the law society needs you to provide, uh, and as long as you are able to manage your financial aspects of the business, raise the invoices, get paid on time, and the whole nine yards, then yes, you don't have need for software. But that's all time of bookkeeping and work that you put into doing that. And today we're being, you know, again, the advent of technology is it has come to a level of commoditization with these different software providers focusing on legal tech. This is probably the best time to be a legal professional. Okay? There was a wave where software money was spent on banks, it still is, one of the leading areas where people spend money. They build tools that can make life easier for bankers and everybody who's involved in that. Then came the advent of retail, where software was built to make sure that retailers and people who purchase stuff, it's convenient and easier for them. Um, and now it's a big wave in the last few years, and it's going to continue only for software companies and vendors to make life easier for legal professionals. So it's only smart to ride that wave and take advantage of the tools that are available to make your life easier. So software, uh, such as legal accounting and practice management, become fundamental. And there is obviously software for email, for standardization if you need separately. But many legal accounting and practice management softwares come along with it. Obviously, having an up-to-date phone is software, too, because if you have outdated phone where you cannot synchronize your calendars, then you're not being today's legal tech professional. Then we move on. So there's many components of software, but one of the most important aspects that you need to keep in mind is exploring your options of a good legal accounting and practice management software. Security. So really depending on whether you have your files locally stored in your computer, in your firm's office laptop or computer, or if this is data on the cloud, you want to question your vendor, you want to question your process of how it's secure. A quick example, if you look at ULaw, we have a bank rate security, which is HTTPS, 256-bit encryption. It's part of our SLA, it's part of our design. You want to question different vendors or your process itself as to whether, you know, what are the different areas of security um, that you go through and ensure that your data is backed up. Ensure that you have a mechanism process or the software doing it by itself, ensure that your data is backed up um, because that's the last thing you want to have is your data destroyed. Um, mobile. Um, again, with the advent of technology, we spoke about that. If you are using your mobile devices to access data, ensuring that it's secure, ensuring that it, there's an auto log off so that nobody else can log into your phone, log into your device, and to your apps that you're using across those devices. And uh, we, we did have a, a webinar now which spoke about how you access internet um, using public Wi-Fi. Uh, it's something that you can always search on YouTube under ULA practice. And if it's got to be remote access, making sure that you have accessibility to emails, 
voice messages. Again, it's just not that. It's, it's having the ability for your staff or your clients to be able to reach out to you even when you're not at work. Okay? That's the real the power of the mobile legal professional. Um, invest in a really good um, voice messaging system. If it's a home, you know, if it's an office phone line, always having ways to access uh, voice messages on your office phone number. You have many systems like Ring Central that offers you uh, VOIP or VoIP services. So a big part of the business management is considering the tools and technologies that can help with it, that can help you manage that business more efficiently. Now let's move on to professional management. Okay, we spoke about this briefly. Professional management is really about who you are as a professional, as a legal professional uh, in the appropriate jurisdiction, um, province, state, et cetera. Uh, and there are many obligations that govern you as a legal professional. So we've kind of tried to highlight some of the top four areas or aspects of it. Um, one of the key aspects of professional management or obligation is completing your CPD hours. I do know for a fact that it's those three hours with professionalism hours, and I think there's a certain number of substantial hours that you have to um, gather or you know, learn or retain as uh, a legal professional on a yearly basis, right, every year. And you report that as part of your, your reporting to the Law Society, which is the governing body, uh, and as you see in terms of Ontario and the different bodies in other provinces. Being part of membership, uh, professional associations, um, you know, it's really not a mandatory thing, but I feel in today's context, being part of a professional association empowers you um, as a professional. It, it really provides you an identity. It gives you the opportunity to communicate and collaborate with peers who are probably on the same boat. Uh, it gives you an opportunity to talk about um, common pain points you know, have a few laughs about, you know, uh, some of the worst times that you've had with clients um, and, and really have that support. And associations, uh, depending on whether you're a paralegal or a lawyer, um, you have your different association memberships available. You have OPA, OPN, TLA. Um, you do have the WPAO. A growing number of professionals, um, legal professionals in Ontario are women very encouraging and should be encouraged further. Uh, so you have different memberships, right? So you determine your right fit. Uh, they obviously have a membership fee, but for that fee, I'm sure, uh, again, your due diligence would really be, what value do I get being part of that association? Okay. And I believe you can be part of multiple associations as well, um, based on ethnicity and region, et cetera. Not only that, you as a professional um, have the obligation of ensuring that you're constantly reviewing uh, new legislations, case laws, rules, and policies that your governing bodies are releasing. You want to be top of um, your act. You know, you want to be well informed about your area of um, practice. And many times being part of that professional association helps you with that. Uh, but we do know a lot of clients who are constantly ensuring they're up to date in terms of legislations to begin with and, and case laws. Um, so different ways in which people have approached a certain case, uh, um, be it for success or otherwise, but really different approaches that help you rethink how you can actually deal with the situation and also keeping in mind the legislations that rule that um, as, as you go out to litigate. Reviewing professional conduct guidelines. Uh, this is something that is, um, you know, many times it's an undertone. It's not spoken about. It's an, you know, it's almost an expectation. But we find uh, many times it's something um, that is underrated. Very important for you as a legal professional to review the professional conduct guidelines. How do you conduct yourself as a legal professional um, representing? Uh, your peers and representing that entire business. 
four components of professional management, reiterating, again, keeping in mind the CPD hours, like today, fantastic idea to be part of the CPD, being part of associations um, for the commandership, ensuring that you're on top of the new legislations and reviewing your conduct guidelines. Okay. Next comes a very interesting topic about time management. And we've kind of divvied it up in terms of time that you spend on a daily basis. Is there a way that you can determine how much that goes towards your legal business? And within that legal business, how much of that time is spent in doing back office work? Or if you can segregate it in a different way, how much of time is spent in which area of practice? So these, again, time being what it is, again, we've spoken, I mean, any, everybody has spoken about time management uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, but if you really focus it from a legal standpoint, from a legal professional standpoint, um, it actually becomes that much more important. And one of the reasons why that is, is because the type of cases and the type of files and the type of matters that you deal on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, if there's just this one file that you do every year, and that's pretty much enough for you to run your business, then good for you. Then the chances are that you still need to manage your time, but the chances are that you probably manage your time way better than a legal professional who needs to deal with hundreds of files on a monthly basis. Because of the quantum leap in the differences that you have within this area of practice, it is of utmost importance that you not only provide, um, how do I say this, enough tools and room for time management within your business, but also have a process of approaching it, okay? So for some pragmatic next steps, do you have a way of managing your task? Do you actually document it? Do you have an individual who can help you with manage those tasks? To-do list is a great way of how you can manage it. Can you do it by matter? Can you do it by client? Do you have a way of determining what are your active and closed files? So that, again, the time spent is on those active files and not focusing on anything else. Do you have software that can help you conflict search faster rather than you have to actually granularly look at it case to case? So these are the types of questions you probably should keep you awake. And if you have answers to these, then fantastic, because that's a big leap forward in you being a legal professional. And a big part of that is, have you spent time on client files where you have actually not built them? So if you're actually doing a lot of pro bono, you probably have to review it so that you can understand how good Samaritan have you been. Um, probably want to deviate up by what areas of practice do I focus on? Which area of practice where I spend lesser time but get bigger value for my money? So let's say you spend lesser time on a family matter. And that's where you're getting a lot of money compared to you spending time on a HTA case where you're, getting, you're spending a lot more time than family, but much lesser revenue. And you really want to compare all those that statistics that come along with your uh, practice. Determine where is time best spent. So time management is really not about um, individual time management and being disciplined. That's a big component of it, being on time, um, you know, keeping track of time spent, but it's also equally important that you have a way of measuring where this time is going, okay? So tools, again, I want to quickly reiterate about time management. Uh, software, again, becomes a big component, and again, it doesn't have to be just legal accounting practice management, so a software that does both legal accounting and practice management will necessarily help you manage time, uh, but there are software tools that are out there that help you through that process to manage time much effectively. And I think this is kind of our last topic in terms of the obligation. Let me again reiterate from the get-go. We spoke about client intake, file management, financial, business, um, and then business management, professional, and that just finished off time management. Um, the next big component would be talking about personal time and personal management. And this is a topic that we 
um, we wanted to put in uh, by design wantedly in this webinar. Uh, we, we recently did a survey. We wanted to talk to all our legal clients and really understand um, whether they're actually happy in doing what they do. Okay, it's a big part. And then the LSUC had actually done a survey as well, um, reaching out to um, all the legal professionals to understand what they like best about being a legal professional, what they don't necessarily like about it. Okay, from your individual standpoint, all we're trying to say is understand what that balance is, have enough time to spend um, towards your family, towards what you like best outside of legal. Uh, outside of your legal business. Um, a big part of who you are and what you do on a daily basis, litigating and going and representing individuals and dealing with dollars and all of that can be overwhelming as it is. You always want to have a plan. And again, this is through speaking with family members, partnering with individuals. Uh, there's many ways you can accomplish it, but please keep in mind that it's important um, that we're doing all of this, you as legal professionals, uh, as overwhelmed as you are, need some time uh, for your own personal space and whatever that may be to relax yourself. You know, it could be jogging, it could be cycling, it could be yoga, it could be anything that you do, transcendental meditation, whatever that it makes you relax, whatever makes you take your mind off and uh, re-energize that, you know, focus back to your work the next day so that you don't over-exhaust yourself, okay? A big component of all the other aspects, especially time management, business management, helps you in many ways. Having the right tools, having the right process by design, as I mentioned, actually helps you sleep well, um, actually helps you have a really good perspective of the legal side of your business so that you can spend more time on your personal management. So, for example, understanding an area of practice that you most enjoy. Unless you're tracking, measuring, and analyzing, um, it's going to be really hard over a period of time once you've been in this business to really understand where you're, what area of practice you like doing, okay? Um, and the area of practice that you probably make money. And these could be two different things. Whether you like it or not, maybe you make more money doing something you don't like. But again, from understanding that is really important. Um, we often come across legal professionals who kickstart their career and kickstart their legal business and uh, many times do not follow a design, uh, do not follow a process. It's almost ad hoc and uh, it's very short-lived. The business, as hard as it can be, uh, if there is not a way that you can understand how you execute on what you've planned on doing, um, can be extremely overwhelming and sometimes you may come short and you have to do, you have to pivot for other things. So it's important for you to understand what that progress and growth means to you as an individual uh, for that business and what financial success means to you and your practice. Take away facing, um, as hard as it is for all of us, uh, as I said, for the type of work that you do, it's overwhelming as it is. Um, so being able to um, record the time and spent work and also taking a vacation. Now here comes an important aspect. So let's say you do take a vacation, that well-deserved vacation. You also want to keep in mind those policies that you want to set up right from the get-go about who would veto or who would be that person who would take care of your files if need be during that vacation time. So do you have a, have you thought about another paralegal or another lawyer who can actually handle your trust money or general money? Uh, is there another person in your firm who can deal with it when you're away? Who handles the communication when you're gone? How do you communicate your client during a file that you're going to take a vacation? So it's really important as, you know, interject all of these different aspects of your legal and personal space, having a plan for it. And last but not the least, ensuring a proper work-life balance is achieved. Um, and again, not bringing that stress. And again, this is um, just free advice 101, but it's really important and critical to what we've seen in this industry 
of the type of professional ethics and the type of work that legal professionals put in on a day-to-day -day basis. So really having that work-life balance helps in many ways reprioritize uh, the tasks that are important, both from a legal perspective as well as from a personal space. Okay? So the last component, a uh, big part of these professional obligations, it's not so much an obligation to the profession. I think this is more of an obligation to yourself and your success that's the obligation, really, is so that you have the sanity to be successful in this profession so that that profession continues to exist, right? So if all lawyers were not satisfied, if all paralegals were not satisfied and not doing well, then, you know, there's every chance that there's a bit of a dip in that overall industry itself. So this is almost an obligation to yourself and, in a way, an obligation to that profession. Now, we've almost come to about an hour of, you know, talking about the different professional obligations. Uh, we've spoken about the areas, right, from client intake to personal management. Now, we have maybe another 20 minutes where we want to focus today's topic on practice management, the aspects of practice management, the benefits of software when it comes to practice management, and we want to keep another 15 minutes towards the end of the session for any Q&A, okay? And that's how we want to plan this out for the next uh, 20, 30 minutes that we have time. So when you consider a practice management tool um, or a software or a method, whatever that may be, it's really important to consider these four areas. You want to consider what your total cost of ownership is. Now, this is something that you can consider if you're a newbie, if you're just graduated from college, um, this would apply to you. This would equally apply to you if you're a seasoned veteran, but you're always looking to improve yourself. So it's something that you can review on a regular basis, whether you're starting off or whether you're looking to improve yourself. Okay? You're always finding that hidden gem. Total cost of ownership. So what does it cost for me to conduct myself as a legal professional and the tools that are required to make my life easier, okay? So specifically in the case of a practice management system, you want to consider what are the overhead costs of running the practice management system, okay? If it's a desktop system, um, is it going to need a lot of software upgrades? What kind of support and maintenance do I have on the software? Is this accessible wherever I go? Um, if this is on the cloud, is there extra cost in dealing with that? So you probably want to ask those questions, do your due diligence, speak to your colleagues, others, and their experience of using tools, and make that decision. Okay. And end of the day, you need to be comfortable and fluent with that product that you choose so that it can help you through that saving time and being efficient. Comes the next point of efficiency in practice. And this is what I mentioned, something that you can do at any time of your life as a legal professional. How do I maximize my efficiency with a lot of automated features that softwares provide you today? You know, 20 years back, um, people didn't have this comfort and luxury that people have today, regardless of which profession. But as I reiterate, a lot of focus is done on legal tech today over the last few years, and it's going to move forward as well so it's, again, a great time to be, from a technology perspective, a great time, a great time to be a legal professional. So how do you maximize the use of these tools so that you can be efficient in your practice management? A great example would be conflict screening, okay? So if you're a newbie, then you probably know your clients by name, by heart. It really doesn't matter. Let's say you're five years into it. Um, the old school way was to be able to just check each and every vanilla folder for that individual's name, ask your admin, ask others in your firm, right, before you ensure there's a conflict or not. But with the advent of technology today, you can actually generate a conflict screening report by just a click of a button. That can quickly give you who those conflicts are, what are those conflicts, what areas, what matters, etc. So really being able to quickly do a conflict search. Being able to search for information, the fact that it's electronically available, 
with the advent of technology makes it much faster. Being efficient is also being on the go. You know, it could also be the ability to multitask. Software products allow you to do that. So it's practice management not only allows you to be doing multiple things, but it allows you to do multiple things efficiently and maximizing that efficiency. And what that means is more time spent with lesser dollars. That's money bank in your bank. In doing so, a big part of your obligation as a legal professional is being compliant with the law society that governs you, right? So the, the governing body actually has certain rules by which you play. Um, audits and spot audits are a big part of you know, your business. Um, I think within the first two years, you will be audited. Uh, and it's a regular audit for that. So ensuring that these practice management software tools allow you to be compliant, obviously, is a double whammy. And Practice Anywhere is just a byproduct of today's um, who we are today. It's just really, we're very mobile. Um, we need access to information from anywhere using any device. And with the dropping rates of people using laptops and computers and moving towards mobile devices, it becomes that much more important and imperative that you have a practice management software that allows you to access information um, from wherever you like to be. And that doesn't have to be cloud. It can be cloud. Cloud is obviously a natural choice, but it also could be a desktop system that you access remote. But it goes back to your total cost of ownership. To accomplish that, you want to keep in mind the amount of money and time that you spend in being able to access a desktop system through a remote process. Okay. Now we've kind of broken down certain key components of that practice management as a legal professional. So one of the first components of that, or one of the key components, I would say, is matter management. So managing daily operations of law practice, um, what does that matter management mean? Again, in no means is this a way of talking about you law, and we don't intend doing that. We just want to talk about what that entails in dealing with the matter. So we spoke about that a little bit early on, about client intake, communication, and service. If I were to further granularize that um, in terms of file management, matter management is your file management. Again, we call it matter in the legal uh, lingo, uh, but it's valuable to organize it, manage it, um, docket your time, disperse your client, and deal with trust money if it's involved for that matter being able to logically divide matters by file numbers, even if it's for the same client, and a sincere way of being able to update matters in a systematic, timely fashion so that you're finishing the work you need to get accomplished, but also getting paid for the time and effort you've put in as a legal professional. So matter management is about docketing time, asking when it happens, dispersing, asking when it happens, if you can, so that you're not playing catch up, but behind the scene ensuring, um, and I do apologize for the horrendous spelling mistake of matter, but um, <laughs> that being said, also ensuring that you have a way of capturing the financial implications and the invoices and you being able to get paid on time, because that's a very critical component of you being a legal professional is being able to get paid on time. And let's say you're done with that matter, being able to chronologically or logically close it, because if you're close with that matter, then it's easier for you to focus on those active files. Once you're done with that matter, you probably then want to analyze at the end of the week, end of the month, how well you've done with certain types of matters, right? So let's say you're really good at doing a certain, let's say a family law, or you're really good at doing WSIB work, then that should indicate the type of work that you'd be taking on. Uh, if a lot of your clients come through, let's say, a billboard or, let's say, marketing on Google AdWords, being able to capture all that as part of that file, you know, allows you to then focus on where you can spend for marketing so that you're focusing on certain areas of practice. Okay? So there's 
much more broader aspects to matter management, but the key components are being able to analyze at the end of the day what that entails to you as a business. And that's what we want to talk about, measuring your practice. And how do you do that? How do you go about measuring the health of your business? So the first thing we want to talk about is understand the state of your practice. So really have a, a frank conversation with yourself about the current state of your practice. Understand what corrective actions need to be taken. So if you understand that certain types of files involving certain types of clients lead to over, you know, overdue payments or people don't pay you on time for certain files, maybe a corrective action would be a much better retainer document. It could probably mean avoiding certain areas of practice because it's something that takes away too much time and provides very little dividend. Okay, so we spoke about pending invoices, pending trust transfers. Okay, but, so that's another thing. So one is the external forces where your clients don't pay you on time. But another thing could be if you deal with trust money but don't have a good discipline of invoicing your client on time and also moving money from trust to general on time, then that's a corrective step that you want to track, measure, and take. Okay, what else can you do? Um, if you are a sole practitioner or if you're a small legal firm, uh, you really need to understand your past success and failures so that you can improve it in the future. Okay? Um, again, free advice 101, but if there's a lot of meaning to what that means is if you cannot understand by data the past success, it's not hypothetical, it's not I could have been better at that, but really understanding it from a data perspective and having those facts available to you to make that decision. Matter, um, you know, analyzing your matter um, should really give you the power of a large law firm. You know, a large law firm today employs individuals who actually can put in the manual effort to give all the information that the owners of those law firms need so that they can be better, improve, and be more profitable in their business. Again. Um, there's a lot of legal aid that's done, but let's not kid ourselves. This is a business. Um, there are many legal professionals that are daredevils who are out there, uh, but if you are in this for business, then you want to keep in mind those strong KPIs that govern and dictate the need for your business. Okay, So if you have to stay profitable, you do have to. Um, and you do provide pro bonos, you want to measure those too. Because if you, you don't want to be the person giving away pro bonos not knowing how much. And why do we all do all of this? Again, why do we do it at the matter level? When you do it at the matter level, it's much more simpler for you to granularly understand the areas of practice that those individual matters focus on. It's not about the client. It's really about the matter and the type of matter that you deal with, right? Because for the same client, you could be dealing with two different set of matters. And in analyzing those things from a matter perspective, you can then make those proactive steps to move your legal firm to the next level, okay? So the two key points are about matter management, really understanding how you manage a matter for the key components of it. And in doing so, please keep in mind the ability for you to analyze your matter so that you can be better at your business. So when you talk about practice management, Calendarization is a key component, and again, as I said, there are many software tools. You have your native emails um, providers that provide you calendars. You have your Outlook calendar. You have your Gmail. You have calendars within your phone devices. Uh, but practice management um, companies do provide their own calendar, and the advantage of that is the ability for you to be able to do everything out of a single platform. And with the event of technology, there's a lot of cross flow of information from a practice management system to all these other third party softwares out there. So integrating practice management, naturally integrating with Google Calendar or Outlook or your phone devices is something that you want to keep in mind. Um, if you already have one, then that's fantastic. If you don't, you can expect that from the technology out there to provide you that ease of convenience. 
So synchronizing your personal calendars, so the ability to not only deal with dockets, which are time bound, but also your personal events, having a better view of your daily and weekly agenda, that becomes a big component of how you can plan your week ahead. Docketing uh, as part of your calendar, so to do tasks, task lists, all of that. So let's say you have a client meeting scheduled between, or a court visit scheduled between 9 and 10 that morning. Um, making that available in your calendar is just going to make it easier for, let's say, your admin or yourself not to double book yourself. And we've often heard about how legal professionals are scampering for time and often are double booked because they didn't calendarize it properly or didn't have a consistent calendar view of all the work that they're doing. We also have lawyers that talk about other areas that they focus on. A lawyer actually, apart from litigating, could actually be teaching at colleges and universities. So time is of the essence, and having a single unified view of all your calendar events makes it that much more important. There's quite a few forms to be filled as a legal professional, uh, and we found that as we moved along. So again, nothing to talk about you law here, but finding a way that you can automate that court form, save that time to put it into better tax. Okay, so that's really important to keep in mind because court forms is a big part and it's there to stay. And it's always changing too, okay? One of the last components of today's presentation will focus on accounting. Uh, we spoke about this briefly up front, but if I were to look at it in a deeper dive perspective, you actually have two aspects to accounting, trust and general, depending on whether you trust or not. So you want to look at the way, you want to find a practice management product, if possible, that can allow you, or a process, or a methodology that can allow you to seamlessly integrate legal accounting with general accounting, or trust accounting with general accounting. Whether it's you using uh, you know, practice management software and a third-party accounting software, or actually using one software that has both, regardless of how you do it, or maybe having a manual process for both, doesn't matter, but it's important that you integrate the two, what it really comes down to, how much of time is spent in accomplishing that. But it's really important for you to integrate both those numbers because that's what's going to give you the true um, message or the true truth about your numbers, okay? Um, especially about trust money. It's, it's important that you have a good handle on your trust money because you don't want to be over withdrawing on your trust. You don't want... Um, any negatives on your trust, you don't want anything to touch your trust that cannot be documented properly. And finally, to reiterate some of the financial management components, we spoke about this briefly, uh, the ledgers, trust receipt journals, and these are part of your obligations by law nine as part of your compliance. These are reports and documents that you probably need to generate on a monthly basis anyways. Your ledgers, your journals, uh, your disbursement journals, fee books, and your monthly reconciliations. These are critical, key. There's about 10 documents, including intermatter trust transfer and Form 9A, if you're dealing with trust money. These are critical components of your financial management documents that you run on a daily basis. Okay? So it's about 4.15 right now, or 4.10 right now, and um, I want to take the next 10 to 15 minutes to open the floor for any Q&A. And um, I hope this was your time well spent. And our key message through the Everything Practice Management um, CPD is just to reiterate the core components of obligations that you have to the profession, but also in a very subliminal way, the obligations that you carry for yourself as a legal professional and as a business owner in ensuring a successful and a happy professional life. Right. So, we, again, the last reiteration, if you will, starting with client intake, file management, financial management, business, um, time management, and personal management. Okay?
A quick question is around timeout. I think one of the components that we spoke about as part of security. Um, if you use the browser to, uh, this is very specific to you all, so uh, probably take that offline. Uh, if there's something specific to the topics that were covered, again, this being a CPD session, uh, if there are certain things that are specific to the um, topic covered today, we'll be happy to take that. So, um, so this is again a question about uh, yes. So, in terms of implementing um, invoicing from within the mobile app, the mobile app of ULA today allows you to access all your information, and that's what it was designed as a starter. The second wave of our implementation or our development is going to involve docketing and dispersing, and being able to add calendar right from your mobile app. That's going to lead the ability for you then to invoice clients from the mobile app. Right now, it's a read-only. The next stage is going to be um, allowing you to dock it time, disperse, uh, put in office expenses, as well as um, being able to calendarize right from the app. In addition to um, a read-only access to your EULA information, you are now able to import all of your contacts right from your phone into EULA. So it's almost a click of a button. If you have all your contacts or your clients' information on your phone, you are able to import that right into EULA. There's a quick question about the client intake um, form itself. So the question is, how do you ensure that you have captured all the information that you need for an initial consult? Um, the, the question again, I'll reiterate that. How do you ensure that you've taken all the information you need for an initial consult? Um, again, that's a good question. I'm assuming the question is, how do you capture all the information? So one of the key components of a client information that you capture um, obviously, it's the first name, last name. The, uh, the Law Society would like you to capture an address, a communication address that you could use on file. So when you actually bring in that client, whether it's from your web form or whether it's just intake right into your practice management software, you want to make sure that you're adding their first name, last name, um, their address, and uh, you know the phone number, email address are optional, but it's obviously a great uh, something that you probably want to get, phone numbers for a must uh, or an email so that you can easily correspond back and forth. And if there's other areas, other things that you want to ask your client, that would be something that's very particular case on case, firm by firm. We've seen a few examples where um, law firms actually ask right in their intake form um, what area of practice or what is the actual issue, if they can give a brief note on what they want to do. Um, so if it's a simple matter and they're happy to take that right from the intake form, if not, it's mostly discussed during that initial consult or when the person actually comes to your office. Another question is, what is a good retainer for different areas of practice? Um, I think I touched upon that. Um, so what we've seen, again, is some, that is something that you probably determine yourself. Uh, and I'm, again, I'm not trying to pass the buck. Different areas of practice have different styles of how you deal with that matter. Okay? So often we've seen POA, HTA are fixed fees. You know, it's not that time consuming. It's rather straightforward. It's just a matter of, you know, a legal representation that's required. And, and sometimes um, there's definite paperwork and work to be done. Um, so mostly POA, HTA could be fixed fees, um, you know, but if it's kind of a criminal matter or if it's something that is time-consuming, um, then you probably want to have a retainer um, that, that helps you cover a piece of costs to begin with. Um, so what we'll, you know, I can give you numbers, but I mean, you want to keep in mind that retainer at least covers the 
costs that are involved in dealing with that client. And a really good habit or practice would also to refresh your retainer, so replenish your retainer, you know, have a way that you can send out an email or communicate. Again, part of that communication is to tell your client that your retainer is actually coming to an end in terms of it's just being depleted. I only have, let's say, $200. And I've seen legal firms actually have policies that if retainers are below a certain amount, then an automatic email goes out asking for the client to provide an, a second retainer. So really, uh, I hope that I answered that question. And uh, so it's really from a case-on-case -case basis based on the area of practice and the, and the matter of it as it is. Uh, this presentation, along with the slides, actually would be uploaded and, will, and you would be sent a link um, at the end of the session. And uh, we have actually sent you a link on the chat window, uh, just a means of being able to take attendance, but also understand uh, how we're doing as a company delivering these CPDs, and we would sincerely appreciate your feedback. Yes, so a quick question is, are we supposed to provide a receipt to the client when we deposit the retainer into the trust fund? Uh, the quick answer is yes. And it, um, it is really important that you actually provide a retainer receipt. And the reason being, you know, just to ensure that there's transparency in the dollar and way of payments. So, for example, if your client paid you $1,000, and you put that into your trust account, and let's say they gave you cash, especially if it's cash, uh, it's more important that, um, you know, Law Society has a rule that if it's 7,500 and below, um, anything 7,500 and above, they cannot provide you cash, but if it's about $1,000, they pay you cash. And let's say you can put, you know, provide them a, a receipt, there's every chance, depending on the individual, but there's every chance that he might come back and say that he paid you $5,000, okay? so. accepting that that's the receipt or the amount paid. So for, for your own sanity and transparency as to why you need receipt.
Sorry about that. This is Praveen again. Yeah, again, a quick reminder to uh, for all of you to please fill in the form that was sent out. And uh, I think some of our clients are having an issue clicking on it. I'm going to try it myself. So I think it worked. So you just have to click on that link. And this is the particular uh, attendance feedback form. So it certainly does work. So there's a quick question about our next CPD. It's on uh, April 28th. And it's actually going to be on a, a new topic about expense management, legal expense management. And it's approved for one hour of CPD credits. A quick question is about how do you ensure that your trust money, I think I don't understand this question, but I'm assuming it means how do I ensure that the trust manage, uh, money is managed properly um, and how do I ensure I move my trust funds? Okay, I believe the question talks about after invoicing, how do you move that money from trust to general? I'm hoping that's the correct question or that's our understanding of the question. So really the process is as part of the legal obligation. So let's say you have a retainer amount of $1,000 and um, you've done work for $500. You raise an invoice for that 500. You are now eligible to send that invoice over and you're eligible um, to move $500 from your trust bank into your general, your own money in terms of your general bank. And um, in Ontario, if you actually do that money transfer in real life through an electronic fund transfer. So really, if you bank with, let's say, TD or RBC, and you move that money from the electronic trust account of TD into the electronic trust uh, general account of TD, uh, you do have to fill a Form 9A. In terms of how do you ensure that you move that money, and that's what probably uh, Practice Management Soft can help you facilitate, understand, which matters actually have pending trust transfers as uh, part of your business. But if you do make that transfer, especially if it's an electronic fund transfer, for each of those transfers, you are obligated to have a Form 9A filled out. If you're actually doing any other means, if let's say you're writing yourself a check, then that's okay. There is no form to fill. It's only for the electronic fund transfer. We have five more minutes before we can close out the webinar, and uh, if there's any further questions, please feel free to uh, continue posting it on our chat or sending us an email. We're taking it either ways. And I hope you're able to still click on that link. I was able to do it myself. And that's what I've done again, just to show it to you. Just have to click on that link, and that's the information we're asking. It's just a quick survey and also a means of us being able to track that you attended the CPD. Um, you are able to get these CPD hours by, uh, you know, at the end of the year by using the Everything Practice Management as a subject line, which is approved for 1.5 hours of CPD credits.
That's correct. So it is for professionalism credit of 1.5 hours, yes. probably have our support staff answer that quick question in terms of timelines for being able to raise invoices from a mobile phone. I believe by end of uh, April we're going to bring in the next wave of being able to dock it time and um, disbursements. I want to say by end of June, but I don't want to confirm still the support staff can do that. But I can certainly respond back to you offline. Um, to ensure that we're on staying on top of that. Thank you. So there's fine, one final question. Maybe we'll take this as the final question, if there are not any more questions, which talks about trust disbursements. So the quick question is, how do I manage disbursements out of trust? Um, that is actually, in fact, a really good question. Um, probably needs a little bit more time for explanation, but I will try and explain it in the next few minutes. Um, so when you actually disperse, you have the opportunity to either disperse by using a general account, which we spoke about, where you use your credit card, uh, or let's say you write a check out of your general, or maybe you pay out of your own owner's pocket or cash account. Now, another way of how you can disperse clients is actually right through their trust account. Uh, a common practice is for legal professionals to write a trust check. So let's say you deposited $1,000 of trust money as a retainer, and let's say you have the habit now of dispersing using your trust, so really not having to deal with you spending the money on behalf, but really using the trust money, then you can write a trust check. A good example would be an application fee or a court fee. Uh, we've seen a lot of legal professionals use trust checks where you basically write a check out of the trust account and um, let's say for $95 of an application fee that money then takes is taken right out of the trust and it's reported as part of the invoice you really don't need to raise an invoice as you would actually have to do from a general disbursement so if you were to do it as a general then you would have to actually pay it first out of your general your credit card whatever raise an invoice, and then move that money from trust to general. But if you do it out of your trust disbursement, then that's money just taken out of your trust account directly. It is still a good practice. Um, sometimes, especially if you don't necessarily um, have a discipline around um, tracking um, the general disbursements, losing bills, or not being able to qualify that in information, it's a really good habit if you if you can. Uh, but yeah, trust disbursement is obviously a great habit too. So with that, I probably will close this webinar. Again, I sincerely thank everyone participating. Please do provide your feedback in terms of how we can make this better for this community. And uh, we wish you a very happy weekend. Thank you.